And Lord God, you truly do reign on all heavens and the earth. Your name, which is higher than every name. And it is our joy to worship you today, Lord God. It is our joy to come together as your family and lift up our voices to you. To hear your words of promise. To hear your words of deliverance. And yet, Lord, in the midst of this, we know we live in a darkened world. That this side of heaven, before you come again, Lord, we still have the enemy at our heels. And yet, Lord, we have a promise from you to, that you would crush the head of the enemy one day. And so we pray, Lord, as we worship you today, that your, your spirit be with us. And I ask for a particular blessing upon this message I'm about to give, these words that are about to come from my mouth, as well as this meditation from my heart, that it might be pleasing in your sight. And that, Lord, you would not allow me to speak a word more, a word less. And I ask this, Lord, for you are our rock, and you, you, Lord, are our true redeemer. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Heavenly Father and from our eternal Savior, Jesus the Christ. Beloved, we're getting closer. It's only three weeks away. It's only three weeks away until we celebrate Christ's victory over sin, death, and the devil. When we get to celebrate Easter Sunday, or as some people like to call it, Resurrection Sunday. But before that, there are still a few days in between. Two more midweek Wednesday services. Next Sunday, we will celebrate, um, or not really celebrate, but next Sunday is the, is the patron saint of green beer. Um, Glad some of you got my sense of humor. Um, and then we'll have Palm Sunday. We'll have Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then Easter, the day that it's all about. And yet I want to talk briefly about St. Patrick, or as I like to call him Patrick. We're like this. Um, but not about the beer part. What, I, what else? I want to talk about what else he is known about. And that's something was the, uh, bringing Christianity to Ireland. Now, Patrick, um, probably actually Father Patrick, most people knew him, but uh, we, can call, we can call him that, and you know, again, we're, we're tight with him. But Patrick also had a bit of a legend built around him. Um, and that legend claimed that somehow he drove the snakes out of Ireland. And into the sea. And the ironic part of that is that from everything I can find, Ireland never actually had snakes in it. And except for a couple of pets that got loose. But like with most legends, there is a history and there is a reason behind it. See, Patrick was also known for getting rid of the old pagan faiths. And the old pagan faiths, they should be, they were synonymous with Satan. And Satan is often known also being as the serpent, the great deceiver. Now Patrick, being a missionary there, he was also sent with a bell with him. And he, when he got there, he rang the bell, and that was to signify the bringing of Christianity to a new area. And as the legend goes, one day after, after Patrick had performed a, a, a long fast, he went up to the highest mountain, and he started to ring that bell. And again, as the legend goes, supposedly the, the people who were part of the old guard, the old deities, they didn't really appreciate this. They didn't appreciate that there was the true God coming into Ireland. And supposedly they went chasing after this ringing. And then Patrick went down to the nearest cliffside and he started to ring the bell and finally he rang it one more time really hard and he threw that bell out into the sea and the old guard, those old serpents, chased the bell out into the water and drowned. But was there really any chasing of the bell out into the sea? Probably not. 
But that's how this legend came about. But the truth is snakes have an interesting place in our culture. For the most part, people don't consider them cute and cuddly, except for a couple of people who I would question who actually sleep with them. Um, Hollywood has also done its fair share of, of using these creatures in their so-called horror films, like the not-so-critically acclaimed Snakes on a Plane, um, which I saw in the movie theater. It is it's so bad, it's good. Um, I like those type of films. But snakes are also associated with being deceivers. Like someone, somebody calls you a snake in the grass. And we also here in the church often think of snakes about, because of the serpent in Genesis early on who deceived Eve into eating the forbidden fruit. And that's a part of what makes this Old Testament reading that we, are, that we heard from just a little bit ago from the book of Numbers. See, just prior to this reading, it's interesting as we read it that, the, uh, that Israel had come into a new area. And they first faced defeat there in uh, um, Numbers 21, verse 1. They feast defeat and their, their enemy take some of their people into captivity. And then we read this portion where it says, And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give this people into my hand, then I will devote their cities to destruction. And the Lord obeyed the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites and they devoted them, devoted them and their cities to destruction. They turned to God, and God gave their enemies over to them. God gave the ability of one, somebody who had defeated them when they were lying on themselves, and when God comes into play, God takes out the enemy. And the bizarre part is what comes next. Because if we jump to verse 5, we see Israel getting impatient with God. And we read, And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of, the, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. They complained. Israel is well skilled at this. Just one chapter earlier, it begins with them complaining again against God. And yet here they complain about, against God, against God's servant, and against God's provision. And at the end of the day, we say, well, they're complaining about three different things. And the reality is, all three, they are complaining about God. And they're saying that what God has given them, whether of himself or his servant that he sent, or of the food that he has been feeding them, that they were essentially, they weren't good enough for them. But I think the saddest part is that they start talking about how wonderful it was to live in Egypt and eat the food there where their ancestors were slaves. And I say ancestors because the old guard had already died off. The ones who had actually experienced this slavery had died off. And the somewhat funny part, and I say somewhat, is, is that, that these people were complaining that they would have had about something, they would have had no idea what life would have been like back then, other than they had heard from their ancestors, from their mothers, from their fathers, from their aunties. That's who would have taught this to them. That's who would have passed this down to them. How wonderful the food was there. That would have been the legacy that had been passed down from their families. A legacy that looked longingly to the past as opposed to longingly look forward to the future of what God had in store for them. We do that in the church sometimes, don't we? We long for the good old days. 
when the pews were full and we had 20 services on one Sunday and all the seats were filled and there wasn't a, everybody was shoulder to shoulder in the entire building. We talk that way sometimes, don't we? But as we look at these, some of the Israel, some people might argue that these Israelites, they're just acting like children. I would, act, I would argue they're acting like human beings. And I say that because we complain about these same sort of things too, don't we? Not only about the way things used to be, how they were so much better, but we complain about it when we don't get our own way. We like to think that we know better than everybody else. We like to complain about how somebody is doing something, not taking into account what they're already dealing with in their lives. We even get into arguments about which color in the crayon box is better. That color carpet would look better. We argue about what color the walls get painted, what color the ceilings get painted. We like to argue about all sorts of things. And yet, I sometimes wonder if God's people who are so passionate about which crayon in the coloring box is better, what would happen if those same people use that same level of passion for sharing the gospel in our darkened world? If we use that same level of passion about things we want to complain about, my house isn't big enough, oh, but you have a roof over your head. What if we took that passion out into our world to tell other people? Because we don't usually care about who we complain to, do we? And yet, we care about who we share the word with, don't we? They might not agree with me. See, it's amazing the passion that we put on different things. And yet, watch what God does when he hears this complaint. Verse 6, we hear, Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So apparently God has had just about enough of their complaining. Wandering in the wilderness, God's trying to prepare them for what is coming down the pipe to get them to a right state. And yet, what do they do nonstop? They complain. He, God has had just about enough of their complaining. And I almost kind of, I kind of had like this memory of my father driving, taking a fi- family trip from New Jersey to Ohio, and my brother and I in the back seat. And he's, he turns around one point and says, So help me if I have to pull this car over. Anybody ever hear that? Anybody ever say that? You know, in the past, we read in the text, God and Moses would often have a conversation about things before there was some sort of response from God. This time, though, God, he doesn't talk to Moses ahead of time. He doesn't talk to Moses about what he's going to do. He just sends these fiery serpents to attack Israel. And these serpents, they're not literally on fire, but when they bit you, you felt like you were on fire before the venom took over and killed you. Now I've got something that's a little controversial to tell you. I really think that God's being merciful here. Yes, some of the Israelites died as a result of this. But to me, the harsher punishment isn't losing your earthly life. As someone who longs for the day that God will call me home, I I long for the day when God calls me home and I won't have to deal with temptation to sin. As as someone who who hates the fact that, as Paul tells us, the things I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. I long for the day when God will call me home and I won't have to deal with that anymore. And yet, as I say to you, these things... What if, in response to Israel's rebellion, to their complaints, what if God just walked away? What if God said, I'm done? I'm done. Have at it, guys. How do you think they were, their lives would have continued to change? Do you think that it would have changed for the better? Or do you think that they would have changed for the worse? Personally, I think that they would have changed for the worse. To me, that's the scarier punishment if God just walked away. 
See, when he gives us over to dishonorable passions, when God says, if you want to live in the filth of your sin, have at it. To me, that's the more terrifying than anything else. Because that is a punishment that can have eternal repercussions. And that should terrify us. We do have to suffer this side of heaven. We all know it. And yet once eternity comes, if, when God calls us home, there is no more pain, no more suffering. For those who follow Christ, there will be none of that. And yet as we look at this text, as God is doling out this punishment to Israel, once Israel realizes, once they grasp how they had been behaving, how they had just metaphorically slapped God in the face by telling him that his food was worthless and that they'd rather go be slaves again just so they can have what they think is a better food, so they can have Twinkies over the rest of their days, God is with them this time. He's let them conquer their enemies when they turn to him. And we need to touch on something else here as they complain about this food. Something I think that is fast and we overlook. See, the food that they were calling worthless, this food was this food that God's been feeding Israel, this manna that they manna that they didn't never knew before God, this manna wasn't some flavorless cracker. This manna was this flaky, sweet, bread-like substance which was extremely malleable and could be cooked into all sorts of forms and fashions. In fact, I recently heard a commentator say that he felt like it was probably was like eating Krispy Kreme donuts. Um, personally, I'm more of a Dunkin', Dunkin' guy, but hey. But the point is, though, that God wasn't giving them food that was just bland. He wasn't giving them a flavorless thing just so they could be sustained. What God had given to his people to help maintain them all through their wanderings in the wilderness, it was full of flavor. Just like God gives us things the side of heaven that are full of flavor and zest, even in the midst of this darkened world. God still was there with them. Through all their wanderings in their wilderness, God was sustaining them in a way that was full of richness. And a part of what's going on here is what Paul gets at in Romans 6, 23, where he says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we're going to touch on that second part in a minute here. But what Paul is saying here is that sin only has one final destination. And that's total separation from God. Basically, that sin will own you if it's left to its own devices. You will be its property. And we can see that. We can see that they longed for the food in Egypt that they never knew. And yet what was back in Egypt were chains. Where they would have a master that would rule over them and it wouldn't be God. I've shared this with some of you. Uh, years back when I worked in the music industry, I had many friends who suffered from substance abuse of various kinds. I, I've never, I never dealt with it myself, but I, I, witnessed, I was witness to several people's behaviors and, how, and their struggles. And sometimes in a more uh, vulnerable state, some of the, those people would try and explain addiction to me. And essentially what they share with me is that their addiction owned them. It would make them do things and go places, both metaphorically and literally. It owned them. It would take over. And much like those Israelites in the wilderness who were forced to look up on on a bronze serpent to be healed for several of those people that I knew, it wasn't until they were arrested and forced to look at themselves and see what their addiction had done that they were able to start to heal. And that's part of repentance, where we admit that we are sinners in need of a Savior. Beloved, in many ways, we too can be like those Israelites. It might necessarily be food that you're turning into an idol. Maybe it's something else. For some people, maybe they turn their jobs into an idol. Where the job takes precedence over everything else. 
For, men, for other people, maybe it's going to bring back the old glory days. Maybe that's your idol. Maybe your idol is a substance. Maybe your idol is, is technology. And then there's a whole laundry list that we could go on with. And Satan, he knows how to hit you. The old serpent wants to take you down. He wants to take you away from our Savior and our Lord. And yet our God loves us too much to leave us where we are. My friends, in the first recorded account of a serpent in Genesis chapter 3, most people, we want to focus about the fall of man, of both Adam and Eve eating of the, the forbidden fruit that they had been forbidden to eat from. But in that same chapter, there is a promise. We hear these words. This is God speaking to the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall crush your head and you shall strike at his heel. And that verse, again, is both a curse as well, of the serpent, but a will, a promise to us, too. Because this side of heaven, that old serpent is still nipping at our heels, trying to get us to focus on the pain, which sometimes does feel like fire in our lives, trying to get us and pull us away, away from God. And yet there is a promise that promises that Christ was going to one day come and defeat sin and the death and the devil once and for all. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, Christ has already crushed the head of the serpent. And he did that for us when he was lifted up on the cross where we were forced to look upon what our sins had done. And when Christ uttered those last words, it is finished, it was then and there as he gave up his life that he crushed the head of the one who would have us be slaves. My friends, the truth is until God calls us to our great reward, Satan is going to continue to strike at our heels, trying to pull us away from God, and yet much like the legend of St. Patrick, in and through our baptisms, Christ daily drowns our sins. He drowns our sinful selves, and he makes us new creations in and through him and his sacrifice for us. Sometimes he has to use bigger ways to make us look at our sins. And yet in the midst of those things, when we turn to Christ, he is right there to give us victory over those things to give us victory over the old serpent brothers and sisters what a god we have as when he calls us to go to his altar it's right there where his forgiveness is as a free gift from god and it is in the name of our one true god that each of us prays and says amen, amen.